we are very proud today to be hosting uh, our speaker, Charles Dorn. Um, he, I, he, he just gave a, a similar lecture in Morocco this past November. Uh, and it was very, what, what struck me about his lecture, he was speaking to a mixed audience of Moroccans and uh, Americans. And the Mor even the Moroccans who didn't quite get the English and the, the nuances of American higher education were genuinely interested and they asked some very probing questions. And I'm sure uh, addressing you tonight, you're probably gonna have even more probing and tougher questions. So, so Charles Dorn is Associate Professor and Chair of the Education Department at Borden College. He earned his BA in American Studies from George Washington University and his MA in Education from Stanford and his PhD in Education from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, his work has appeared in the American Journal of Education, Diplomatic History, Teachers College Record, and History of Education Quarterly. And he is the author of American Education, Democracy and the Second World War, published in 2007. His Center for Global Humanities lecture, the one he's given tonight, is drawn from research for his current book project, which is titled For Common Ends and for the Common Good, A New History of Higher Education in America, which is forthcoming from Cornell University Press. Please help me welcome Professor Dorn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for, thanks for coming out tonight. And thanks also to those of you tuning in from afar and <clears throat> particularly uh, from the, the Tangier uh, campus. I had such a wonderful experience there uh, last, uh, last semester meeting with the students. For me, it was a return home in some way. My wife and I lived in Casablanca many years ago and this was the first time that I had an opportunity <clears throat> excuse me, to, re to return to Morocco. And the campus that, that the University of New England has established there is, is really quite remarkable. Uh, and it's in a remarkable place, in a remarkable country, in a remarkable part of the world. So uh, I feel very, very fortunate um, to, have, to have been there. And I'm especially grateful to be a part of the Center for Global Humanities seminar series. And, and I would like to, to thank uh, Professor Anwar Majid, um, UNE Vice President for Global Affairs and Communications for his kind invitation to be with you this evening. Um, so my talk's title refers to this book that I've been working on that, um, that Anwar mentioned. And I'm just putting the finishing touches on the book. So, so what you're getting here tonight is a bit of a preview. Uh, but what I'd like to do this evening is briefly describe the book's origins, its framework, uh, and then spend most of my time sharing what I learned through the research and then hopefully set aside a good chunk of time for questions because I think as we're all aware, the topic of higher education and higher education in American society is one that be has become um, uh, quite popular, uh, quite critical in some ways. And my hope is through this research project is to, is to shed some more light on the issue rather than more heat on the issue and to try to help us to better understand the nature of American higher education in society today. Um, before I jump in though, uh, sort of a, a short personal story that relates to the topic. So I'm a historian who first discovered uh, the field of higher education history while I attended Stanford as a master's degree student, uh, well it's over 20 years ago now. And at first my interest in the field was quite personal and if there's time later I can give you a little bit of the backstory. But for now let's just say that prior to becoming an undergraduate student, I had always been led to believe that the purpose of higher education was job preparation, that really it was purely occupational. Um, yet I actually never experienced college in that way. So as, a, as an undergraduate student majoring in American studies, um, for instance, I never thought of studying American literature as a kind of job training or something of that sort. Um, now, as it turns out, I became a high school social studies teacher, so I suppose there was some relationship between what I was studying and what, what I wound up teaching. But still, that disconnect between what I had led to believe higher education was for and what I actually experienced as, as a student remained with me for, for quite some time. So, okay, so now I'm, a, now I'm a master's degree student at Stanford and I'm studying educational history and I begin to read about the history of Stanford University itself, 
And my attention is captured by the university's founding grant, um, which equates to what we would call the mission statement for an institution today. Now, if, if you don't know the story, in 1885, Jane and Leland Stanford founded what is technically the Leland Stanford Junior University. Uh, it, was, it was founded in memory of their recently deceased son, Leland Stanford Jr. And uh, the, the Stanfords granted this institution, a new institution, a $30 million endowment, which, which was the largest higher education gift in history up to that moment in time. Um, but Leland Sr., who you can see here, um, especially uh, Leland Sr. was a robber baron kind of guy, uh, a railroad tycoon. He also served as governor and US senator from, from California. He wanted to establish a university with a practical purpose. Um, he described graduates of Eastern colleges, such as my home institution of Bowdoin College, by the way. Uh, he described these graduates of Eastern colleges who sought employment from him as members of what he called a helpless class. Um, and so here's a quote. Uh, he said that they are generally prepossessing in appearance and of good stock, um, but they have no definite technical knowledge of anything. They have no specific aim, and they have no definite purpose. Sort of a damning sort of uh, claim of, of the Bowdens of, of the, uh, the graduates of Bowdoin College. Um, in contrast, then, he described his own university by saying, it is to overcome that condition, to give an education which shall not have that result, which I hope will be the aim of this university, its capacity to give a practical, not a theoretical education, ought to be accordingly for most. So hopefully you get a sense of the distinction here between a theoretical liberal arts education and what Stanford hoped to achieve through his more practical institution. Um, but this does not mean that the Stanfords rejected what we might call higher education's civic purpose. In fact, just the opposite. Uh, in their university's founding grant or mission statement, the Stanfords were very clear that although the university's central object was to qualify its students for personal success. Its central purpose was, quote, to promote the public welfare, end quote. So I did some thinking about this uh, while I was a student at Stanford. The compatibility, or alternatively, the tension between higher education's role in fostering personal success or private advantage and its commitment to promoting the public good. Um, and then I graduated from Stanford and I went back to teaching high school for another five years. Um, but those questions stuck with me over time so that when I returned to graduate school to pursue my PhD, this question of how educational institutions have historically defined their civic roles and how, if at all, they have fulfilled them over time became central to my research. And so for you know, more than a few years ago now, I decided to pursue just that question in the form of this book project. And that's essentially what I'm sharing with you this evening. So my goals in the project were threefold, and I have to admit they were somewhat sort of grand and expansive. Um, first, I wanted to examine this question, this tension between private and public goods in higher education, I wanted to examine this over a long period of time, over the course of about 200 years or so. Um, secondly, I wanted to frame the study, and certainly the research question, in a way that it would result in my writing a comprehensive history of American education, higher education. So rather than a sort of narrowly conceived study, I wanted this to be fairly expansive. And then third, I wanted to use history to shed some light on the so-called crisis in higher education that we believe we're experiencing today. Now, as many of you are aware, uh, much of the rhetoric surrounding the crisis involves concerns over effectiveness and access and affordability. Those seem to be the three sort of primary issues with which people are, are concerned. But at a deeper level, I actually think that the current reconsideration of American higher education that is occurring today has a whole lot to do 
with how we think of colleges and universities' primary purposes in American society, um, particularly its public or its civic purposes. And so I'll say more on that a bit later. But in terms of those larger issues, I think the underlying um, concern here has to do with public purposes. OK, so assuming one wants to write a book like this, how do you approach this project? Um, conceptually, to make a sort of a long story short, I actually borrowed an idea from educational reformer Abraham Flexner, who wrote in 1930 that higher education is, quote, not outside, but inside the general social fabric of a given era, and that colleges and universities are expressions of the age. Uh, by which he meant that, as established, colleges and universities are emblematic or reflective of the priorities, the social, the political, the economic priorities of the periods in which they are established. And so what I decided to do was to investigate the founding decades of, I thought at the time, between 10 and 12 higher education institutions, founded over the course of about 200 years, and incorporating a wide geographic area. Uh, and so ultimately, the 11 that I eventually settled on researching are um, Georgetown College, present-day Georgetown University, which was the first, the first Roman Catholic Jesuit institution of higher education founded in the United States. It was also the recipient of the first federal charter uh, for, a, for a university. Um, the second, my home institution of Bowdoin College, which when founded was an all-male denominational institution that was affiliated with congregationalism. Uh, South Carolina College, which is present-day University of South Carolina in Columbia, it was one of the nation's first fully state-supported and state-controlled colleges in the country. Um, the Agricultural College of the State of Michigan, which is present-day Michigan State University, um, it was the prototype for what we call today the land-grant universities in the United States. And then the California State Normal School, which is present-day San Jose State University. Um, and that was founded um, in an effort to train public school teachers. Uh, it was also the first public institution of higher education founded on the west coast of the United States. Howard University, which is a historically black college university, it was supported by the U.S. Freedmen's Bureau, founded immediately following the Civil War to educate African Americans following emancipation. Uh, Smith College, which is a women's college, uh, which was founded to provide equal higher education opportunity for women, uh, Stanford. The University of South Florida uh, in Tampa, which was a public university founded to, um, to provide um, uh, an education to what were called non-traditional students in this expanding urban area following the Second World War. And then a sort of a twofer here at the end, uh, Rhode Island Junior College, which is the present day Community College of Rhode Island, and Santa Fe Community College. And these are two year institutions that were founded to serve non-traditional students as well in, in a two year uh, setting. So that's the 11. Uh, what did I learn from all of that research? Uh, and, and, and the research involved, of course, um, going to each of these institutions and working in the archives for some amount of time. So the amount of time it took to do the research was actually quite extensive, um, longer than I had anticipated. But, but nevertheless, you know, what did I learn from all of that? Well, first of all, I, I learned that, um, for the most part, a Abraham Flexner was right. Um, that higher education institutions have indeed been expressions of their age. And although we often characterize them as ivory towers as sort of set apart from society, uh, they have not historically been, what Flexner said, outside but inside the general social fabric of a given era. Um, and the second thing I learned, which gets right to the heart of the sort of the thesis of the book or my central claim in the book, and, and that is that many of the socially widespread preferences and attitudes that existed in the, in the United States between the late 18th century and the early 20, 21st century, of the many sort of socially widespread preferences and attitudes that existed in our country during that time, there were four really that stand out. Civic mindedness, practicality, commercialism, and affluence. And so 
those are the four ideas that provide a sort of conceptual framework for the book. Um, these four have played pivotal roles in transforming colleges and universities' dedication to the common good over time. And in fact, they have played pivotal roles in transforming American higher education more broadly. Um, in the book, I then go on to argue that these four have always been present and always in tension in American society from early in the nation's history. Yet each one of these, uh, and I, I call each an ethos, um, each ethos gained predominance over the others during one of the four chronological periods that I examine, consequently influencing the character of institutional debates within higher education and telling the definitive story of its time or era. So that's an important point for me to be clear about, that it's not as if as, as we march through time chronologically, each one of these sort of shows up for the first time. Not at all. These have always been with us in American society. But at various moments in our nation's history, one surges forward and defines the terms of institutional debate and the character of higher education during that moment in time before over time it recedes and another, and another moves forward. So how does that process sort of look in the historical record? What does that look like? Um, so we'll start with, with the early national period. Uh, now as it turns out, and this really is actually just by chance, the first president of Bowdoin College, the Reverend Joseph McKean, is cited quite frequently in the historical literature as having offered a very precise articulation of higher education's commitment to the public good in his inaugural address in 1802. Um, and this is, what, this is what McKean said. It ought always be remembered that literary institutions, by which he meant colleges, that literary institutions are founded and endowed for the common good and not for the private advantage of those who resort to them for education. Those aided by a public institution to acquire an education are under peculiar obligations to exert their talents for the public good. Now, you'll notice that McKean described Bowdoin as a public institution. And that is important to note because the distinction that we make today between public and private colleges and universities as it relates to things such as financing and governance and authority and control, that distinction simply did not exist um, in the early 19th century. And so by calling Bowdoin public, what McKean meant was that it was an institution that existed to serve the public good. And therefore, anyone who benefited from being educated at that institution had an obligation, right, what he called a peculiar obligation, to exert their talent for the public good. And that is how public was defined in the early 19th century in the United States. So now, as I say, McKean is frequently cited for how clearly he articulated higher education civic purpose. But the thing to keep in mind is that he hardly proposed a new role for the American college. Um, in fact, really just the opposite. Similar claims at the time are made about the founding of South Carolina College. It was said that the establishment of a college in a central part of the state where all its youth may be educated will highly promote the instruction, the good order, and the harmony of the whole community, a public good. Um, and even Georgetown College, which was established ostensibly to prepare young men for the seminary, claimed in its founding statement that it existed to promote more effectually the grand interests of society. And so rather than being specific to Bowdoin then, um, claims to promote the common good were in fact widely shared uh, amongst leaders of institutions of higher education in the early 19th century. Um, and they, I argue, derived this mission from an ethos of civic mindedness that was more broadly in place in American society at the time. And not only then did the institutions derive their mission from this social ethno ethos of, of civic mindedness, they then sought to cultivate it among the students. In fact, it, they, can, they deemed it to be one of their primary purposes, cultivating a sense and ethos of civic mindedness among students. 
So what did, you know, what did that look like in practice if you were in the early 19th century and you wanted to cultivate civic mindedness amongst your college students, how would you go about doing that? Um, well, it looked like a couple of different things. First of all, it looked like an effort to inculcate um, mental discipline and integrity amongst the students with the expectation that by doing so and graduating these students, they would become virtuous members of society and they would practice what were called even at the time the liberal professions, which included the ministry for sure, uh, but also law, medicine, teaching, and what today we might call public service, um, in other words, serving in elected office. And in that way, students were meant to contribute to the stability and the maintenance of the new republic. So they receive an education, they're under a peculiar obligation to support and promote the common good, and they do that by serving through these liberal professions. Okay, so how did college administrators and, and faculty intend to accomplish that objective? Well, so first of all, the colleges adopt a classical curriculum. Um, that is to say that students study the classics. They study Socrates and Plato and, and Homer. Um, and all of the colleges adopt a pedagogical method that conceives of the mind as a muscle that needs to be constantly exercised. And that exercising was accomplished primarily through memorization and recitation in Latin and Greek. So the mind is a muscle, you have to exercise it, and the way you do that is by having students memorize hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, of the classics in the original Latin and the Greek, and then to have them recite them from memory. Um, and then the other part of this project is that you adopt these very severe codes of conduct that are designed to regulate student behavior. And so between the academic piece and the student life piece, you're going to basically foster these virtuous citizens. Um, so how did that go? Uh, at best, mixed results, at best. Um, and I have to say here that, you know, just an aside, the one thing that I've learned from the research on this project is that there has never been a golden age in higher education when all of the students showed up for class on time, uh, when they all took their studies seriously, when they all did the reading before class. You know, it has just never existed, okay? Um, and I can give you a very entertaining example from Georgetown College. This is a report, I sort of stumbled upon this while I was doing my research. This is a report of a failed oral examination conducted of a student whose name was Francis Ward. Um, and, I'll, and I'll quote from the actual exam. Uh, this is the follow-up, what the examiners had to say about Francis Ward. Um, they said, what shall be said of Francis Ward? Misfortunes surround him on all sides, yet he laughs as cheerfully as ever. Misfortunes in Demosthenes, in history and catechism, and total ruin in Homer. And yet Francis Ward seems undismayed. Francis Ward has studied Horace and Homer for a year and a half, and yet we are told that he does not to appear to understand either of them. Yet Francis Ward constantly assures us that he studies. What shall be our inference? Shall we doubt his veracity or his capacity? <laughs> You've got this sort of, you know, really interesting sort of way of, of describing the, the student performance on their exams. Um, so it didn't always work, what the plan didn't always work. Um, similarly, although the colleges are looking to foster virtuous behavior, students, at least in their own behavior, fail to cooperate quite frequently. Um, at Bowdoin College, for instance, uh, punishments are handed out for negligence in study, leaning head on seat in front at prayers, and playing cards for money, uh, and finally making bonfire in yard. This was something that you would be penalized for. Um, now, one of the forms of punishment at the time, in fact, was to actually levy fines on students, to fine them for their bad behavior. And so in 1823, uh, Bowdoin finds a student by the name of Nathaniel Hawthorne. The name might ring a bell, right? Um, uh, Hawthorne is fined 20 cents for absence from college for one night, right? In other words, he, he left campus and didn't come back. Um, 50 cents for neglect of declamation, which means he cut class, essentially. Uh, and then 20 cents for absence from public worship, which means he skipped the mandatory chapels, 
service. So you need to keep in mind that tuition is eight bucks per semester, and he's just racked up a dollar's worth of fines, right? Uh, so Hawthorne is not, right, the most cooperative student of all time, right? Um, but in fact, those violations and penalties are actually really small stuff compared to some of the things that went on. And here I have to sort of offer another aside, and that is that college students have always misbehaved, right? Um, and that many of the behaviors that we witness on campuses today really actually look like kids' stuff compared to some of the stuff that went on uh, historically. So, so let me give you a quick story from South Carolina College. It's February 1814. And faculty catch three students trying to steal the college bell with the intent of preventing the day's recitations from beginning, right? So if the bell doesn't ring, the school day can't start, right? OK. So the college um, figures out who's trying to do this, and they suspend the three students almost immediately. Um, but the rest of the student body rises up in absolute revolt. And so, um, they wait until the evening ringing of the bell, which ends the school day. And then they put on disguises. And basically, they go on a rampage. Um, they march to the building that houses the bell. They break down the door. They steal the bell. They then burn a faculty member in effigy out in the, in the yard. Uh, they start hurling bricks at the windows of the college tutors. They, have to, they attack a faculty member's house. And the documented reports are essentially that it's, you know, that it's, that it's total chaos. And so the, the president contacts the board of trustees and says, you know, what do we do? The board of trustees contacts the local militia. The militia comes in to put down the riot. And uh, at the end of the evening, they station, um, they station, station militia members at the houses of faculty members in order to protect their property for the rest of the night. So I'm thinking like student protests this day is, you know, these days are pretty light handed compared to some of the stuff that, that went on in, in the past. Um, so anyway, I could spend the you know, rest of my time discussing just this era in history, right? Uh, the regional distinctions between the institutions, uh, because one of the reasons that I tried to capture a wide geographic range is to, to have a better understand of those re understanding of those regional distinctions. Um, the co-curricular life that students develop parallel to the college's academic life, there's a rich history of literary societies in our, in our early colleges. And what's interesting about the literary societies is that the college the colleges don't establish them. The students establish them. Um, and they become student-driven organizations. Um, we could also talk about the ways in which, in fact, large majorities of students ultimately do fulfill what McKean called these peculiar obligations that the colleges expect of them by pursuing the liberal professions, for instance. And then also we could talk about what the students themselves have to say about all of this, um, because that's there in their diaries and their journals. And we have some really wonderful collections of diaries and journals from the early 19th century that, that give us access to how students thought about all of this, this stuff. It's all quite interesting. But instead, I want to move us along chronologically, really, because it's what happens next in the story that I think actually illuminates a characteristic of our, of our current higher education crisis. And, and this, is, this is how that works. Over time, and certainly by the 1840s, by what we call the antebellum period in American history, these early colleges, the Bowdens, the South Carolinas, the Georgetowns, become increasingly exclusive. Um, it costs more and more to attend them, for instance. The admissions requirements uh, increase, and they increase to include greater proficiency in Latin and Greek. And in that way, they actually continue to benefit privileged applicants who have received private tutoring in the classics prior to enrolling in college. So there's this increasing affordability issue as well as concerns over access. And simultaneously, there's a growing movement in the United States questioning the, the efficacy and the effectiveness of a classical education, and especially this sort of mind as a muscle pedagogical model. And all of those changes, uh, the movement questioning the efficacy and the effectiveness, all of those are linked to changes in America's political economy, including populism. This is right, the period of the rise of Jacksonian democracy, for instance, and the expanding industrial and commercial sectors in the United States. So change is afoot in America. Um, and here is where, in my mind, sort of the genius of American higher education reveals itself. Because during this next period, the antebellum and the Civil War period, um, practicality, an ethos of practicality, will replace civic-mindedness 
as the dominant ethos in American higher education. In other words, a course of study with some practical application comes to be prioritized over what becomes characterized as the esoteric study of the classics. And, and it's then institutionalized, this sort of practicality, this ethos of practicality is institutionalized through the establishment of colleges and universities devoted to the study of agriculture, mechanics, mining, and the military. And that is later abbreviated as A&M. So if you've ever heard you know, Texas A&M, for instance, that's what the A&M stands for. Um, and also teacher education. And this is the moment in the US history when teacher education as its own form of study comes forward. Um, so another way to understand this development is that the early colleges, the Bowdens, the South Carolinas, the Georgetowns, resist simply replacing their educational program with a new one. Instead, what they will do is they will slowly adopt elements of these practical reforms over time. And they'll adopt them into their collegiate programs, right? But for the reformers of the day, that process is way too slow. And so what they're going to do is advocate for, advocate for entirely new forms of higher education, new kinds of institutions uh, in American higher education. And eventually, we will come to think of those institutions as simply part of higher education in America. But at the time, in fact, they were sort of radical and novel. Um, and this is a pattern that we actually see repeated over and over again throughout history, and I would argue is, in fact, in play today. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about that a little later. Um, so in the book, I have two examples that I provide of this shift towards practicality. And they're the Agricultural College of the State of Michigan and the California State Normal School. But of course, there are actually many more. And you could probably start to generate in your mind a list of some of these practically oriented institutions that are created in the United States prior to the Civil War, MIT, for instance, or the US Naval Academy. And there are a whole, whole list of, of them. Um, now, I'm not going to go into a detailed history of Michigan and California, but, but let me say this. Michigan's Agricultural College is the first four-year college in America to teach what was called scientific agriculture. And as I mentioned earlier, the Michigan College becomes the prototype for the nation's land-grant institutions. Um, it eliminates Latin and Greek as admissions requirements completely. Uh, it provides paid work to students on the college's experimental farm so that the students can pay their way through college um, and work their way through college. And it offers this practical curriculum, which includes animal and vegetable physiology, entomology, and, and horticulture. The California State Normal School, on the other hand, is designed to prepare students to become classroom teachers. Uh, the name Normal School comes from the French teacher training institutions, the Ecole Normale, and they offer a combination of secondary school coursework and teacher education, including practice um, in what were called model or laboratory schools that were comprised of grades, grammar school age students. So attached to the normal school would be just a regular school and the students at the normal school would practice their teaching in the regular model school that was comprised of just grammar school age kids. So, but what I'd like to highlight here regarding these, uh, these two places that's, is that all of these institutions are anchored in practicality rather than civic mindedness. They solve, at least for some people and at least for the time being, the affordability and access problem because they offer higher education opportunities to students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. A lot of farmers' sons will attend the agricultural college. Um, and in the case of normal schools, they offer higher education to many women who had, up until that point in American history, been shut out of higher education almost completely. And so in doing so, they, have, they make this contribution to the common good, to the public good, by making higher education more accessible and more, more affordable. To many, uh, to, to many Americans. Um, OK, so moving on sort of in time here, the Civil War prov provides a turning point for higher education, as it does for most areas of American life. Um, and the, 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 the war will usher in, among many other things, a commercial ethos in the United States. What historian Alan Trachtenberg has, I think, fabulously called the incorporation of America. And this occurs in the, in the late um, 19th century, 
and certainly moves into the early 20th century. Um, and so consequently, over time, commercialism, an ethos of commercialism, will replace practicality as America's dominant social ethos. As it applies to higher education specifically, this development is most vividly described by economist and sociologist Thorstein Veblen in his work, The Higher Learning in America. Now, some of you here might be familiar with Veblen's work uh, and also with, with this pr particular work. Um, the, 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 tub, the subtitle of the book was somewhat provocative, A Memorandum on the Conduct of Universities by Businessmen. Uh, and this was sort of a new way of thinking about college and university uh, at this moment in time. Um, in language that one might imagine being used to describe corporate influences on higher education even today, Veblen writes that by the beginning of the 20th century, pecuniary values had come to predominate on college and university campuses, and that business proficiency had replaced higher learning. And he continues like this, it means a more or less effectual further diversion of interest and support from science and scholarship to the competitive acquisition of wealth. It means an endeavor to substitute the pursuit of gain and expenditure in place of the pursuit of knowledge as the focus of interest and the objective end in the modern intellectual life. So if you accept Veblen's criticism and you compare it with what's, let's say, what Joseph McKean was claiming in his inaugural address, you see these really, really stark differences between the two. Um, and this, in fact, brings us back to Stanford University. Uh, because Veblen wrote the higher learning while he was living in Palo Alto and serving as associate professor at Stanford, a university that, as we already saw, had a stated commitment to qualifying its students for personal success. But the interesting twist here is that Jane and Leland Stanford wind up establishing a non-denominational, co-educational, and if you can believe it, a tuition-free university, leading them to claim that their institution promoted the public welfare by expanding higher education opportunities again to more Americans. Um, that being said, Stanford is undoubtedly, the university at least, is undoubtedly infused by commercialism, and the symbolism really is everywhere, even on, on the day that the university opens to students. Um, if the $30 million founding endowment that was generated by Leland's commercial enterprise wasn't enough, um, Herbert Hoover, who is president of the United States during the onset of the Great Depression, right? Herbert Hoover is a member of Stanford's first graduating class. The university establishes one of the first business schools in America, and it is a pioneer in the commercialization of intercollegiate athletics. It is one of the first universities in America to have an over 70,000 seat stadium in order to um, bring in the, 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 the crowds to watch the football games. Right. Um, but yet, again, what's interesting here is that as commercialism comes to predominate, in higher education, entirely new forms of higher education institutions come into existence, beginning with these strange places called universities, um, which somewhat paradoxically incorporate practical curricula. This is what Leland said he wanted, right? A practical, not a theoretical education. So they incorporate practical in curricula. Um, they include professional training in law, in medicine, in business. But then they also have this element of disinterested scholarly research, right? This is the birth of the research university in America. And so you have this one institution that tries to sort of fit together these varying pieces uh, in some coherent way. Um, moreover, now, this period of time is also uh, the, the era of the women's college, such as Smith, and the historically black college and university, such as Howard. And these places were established partly, in fact, in reaction against commercialism. Um, but nevertheless, they soon become infused by it for a variety of reasons. Um, so Sophia Smith, for instance, establishes her college as a kind of early 19th century civic-minded Bowdoin, or Amherst, which was nearby. Um, and she founds it with similar admissions requirements and a similar academic program as the male colleges. And this is the first time that this had happened in, in US history. 
Um, Howard University, similarly infused with a civic-minded ethos, um, and at Howard, if, at least, that, that is at least in part because Oliver Otis Howard was a Bowdoin College graduate, and he imported to Howard University the experience that he had had as a student at Bowdoin. Um, but even though Smith and Howard are founded with a civic-minded ethos sort of built into them, um, neither resist the pull of commercialism for very long, uh, because you know what college and universities founder, college and university founders intend for the institution, is certainly not always what students have in mind, right? And so, in these two instances, you wind up with these very interesting generational gaps between the early generations of women women's college graduates and the early uh, generations of historically black college and university graduates, and then the later generations. With the first generations expressing a sort of civic-minded ethos, at Howard University, it's defined as race uplift, for instance. Um, but th those early generations will then take the later generations to task for not maintaining this civic commitment and instead expressing a sort of commercial ethos. They're far more interested in getting jobs and, you know, and, and making it in the world than the earlier generation. So you wind up with interesting generational gaps that, are, that have been sort of documented in the literature at places like women's colleges and HBCUs. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me just talk briefly about my final time period here, which is the post-World War II era. And in a way, for me, this is sort of the most interesting of the four because it's the period during which higher education participation becomes at least somewhat of a normal part of life for many Americans. And it is also the period that witnesses the rise of affluence as the predominant social ethos in America. And it's, it's that ethos that I argue remains with us today. Now, many scholars have written about post-war affluence. Again, many of you uh, in the room will know the work of the economist John Kenneth Galbraith, his 1958 work, The Affluent Society. But few historians have actually examined the consequences of affluence for, high, for higher education, which I think is a real deficiency, um, because it was during just this period that an increasing number of Americans come to view a college degree as a ticket to the good life, a sort of passport to the American dream. And it's also during this period that the federal government began providing the financial resources in the form of things like the GI Bill, Pell Grants, subsidized student loans, to make that ticket more accessible to more people. And so during this period, which educational historians have dubbed the golden age uh, because of skyrocketing student enrollments and the expansion of higher education, um, students actually increasingly seek higher education for the financial benefits that are accrued from obtaining a degree. Now, in addition, college and universities, no less influenced by an ethos of affluence than the students that they enroll, the, college and the, and the colleges and the universities begin to seek institutional wealth and status in an ever more competitive, what becomes known as higher education marketplace, which is a post-World War II phenomena, the idea that higher education functions within a marketplace. So this development is manifested through the establishment and the expansion of large urban universities. And a good example is the University of South Florida in Tampa and the massive growth of junior and community colleges, such as those in Rhode Island and New Mexico. Both kinds of institutions sought to support non-traditional students, first-generation students, students of color, especially students from impoverished areas, providing yet another example of higher education's you know, long-term dedication to the common good, at least in terms of, of access and affordability. Yet many of these institutions will prioritize occupational training programs that provide students with opportunities to fulfill vocational ambitions and acquire wealth. And that ultimately results in some institutions in America adopting slogans such as learn more, earn more, and career dreams begin here, right? So these are occupationally oriented institutions. So consequently, although the term affluent is not routinely one that is used to describe public higher education, right? And it's certainly not a term that is typically used to describe community colleges that have for decades been struggling with the challenges of declining state appropriations. 
This social ethos of affluence nevertheless has a very powerful effect on the form and of the function of just these, just these places. Which brings us to the 21st century and the present crisis in higher education. Now, history does not predict the future, and I wouldn't suggest that it does, but I actually think we can glean some important insights into the present by studying the past. And one of the insights that I've gleaned from this project, which I've mentioned now a number of times, is how previous higher education crises have often been met by the creation of entirely new institutional types, which when that is combined with previously existing institutions slowly changing what they do and how they do it, has sustained higher education's commitment to the common good, at the very least in terms of affordability, access, and perceived effectiveness. And that's a sort of pattern that repeats itself and has repeated itself for about 200 years. Um, to put it bluntly then, in terms of my own conclusions uh, based on the research, the lessons of history firmly contradict claims that colleges and universities are about to be disrupted by technology, for instance, in ways that are going to lead to the end of college, which, uh, for example, is what Kevin Carey has suggested in his most recent book with that title. I just don't think that the history points in that direction. Um, in fact, I think that doomsday predictions of the kind that have sort of wrecking balls moving on to college campuses, right? And knocking down places like, you know, Alumni and Proctor Hall or Bowdoin College's Hubbard Hall. I, I, I just think that those claims are vastly overstated. Um, and that in fact, that, you know, historical studies suggest just the opposite. Um, history suggests that we are indeed going to see real changes in higher education, that new institutional types and in the present day, that might be the virtual university, but I'm not, I'm not so sure, but it might be. Um, we are going to see uh, these new institutional types arise, and we will see older institutions like UNE, like Bowdoin, for instance, um, being compelled to respond in some relevant and meaningful way. But that seems a far cry to me from the demise of American higher education. Uh, that seems a far cry for me from the demise of an institution that historically, at least, has survived so many das disasters, uh, including, for instance, civil war, world wars, um, and economic calamities. And it has, you know, it has even survived the rise of intercollegiate athletics, if you can believe it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. If you have any questions, please uh, make sure you get the microphone first before you ask the question. And they're on both sides of the, of the room. Let's see, we have a gentleman down front. Great. Yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Arthur Fink, I obviously am not a researcher. I'm a participant observer. I'm surprised at, at something you didn't say. Hmm. I mean, I was at Swarthmore, which was at the same t in the same tribe as Bowdoin. Right. My sense was that there are a set of these small liberal arts colleges that could stay remarkably true to the classical ideal, discarding Latin and Greek, yeah. but a learning community for the sake of fine learning mm. and mental agility. Yeah. You learn to tell the truth, to ask deep questions, mm. to, to, to play the role of the scholar. Yeah. While alongside that, a parallel track developed of large commercial institutions that now are measured in magazines by how much attendance will, will affect your initial uh, earning the year that you graduate. Right. right. And, and so there isn't one track, but there's a bifurcation. Mm. Does, that, does that resonate with your finding? And, and if so, why are you talking about about it as if there was just one track. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks. It's a great question. We're getting hard questions tonight. Yeah. Is that the, okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. You didn't tell me that before I came. Um, so, so it's a terrific question. So, um, so I would say that what I'm trying to present um, through this research is a sort of a, a theory that in fact tries to unify all of these disparate elements of American higher education. You know, we use the label, right? We say American higher education as if it means one thing. 
And you really need only to sort of scratch the surface to see that there are many, many different kinds of institutions with many, many different purposes uh, serving lots of different student populations. And so can we actually talk about an American system of higher education? How does that make sense to us? And so really what I'm trying to do is uh, present a way of understanding how this remarkable vari institutional variety developed over time um, and helped to sort of legitimize or make sense of this claim that there is something called American, American higher education. You're absolutely right, at the, at, at, at particularly around the piece of the residential piece, which I think is part of, of what you were describing here. Um, there, are there are radical differences um, between higher education institutions that claim to do part of their work through a residential program and those that don't. And the, the very nice sort of um, um, contrast for me is to take the early national period, a place like Bowdoin, and put it up against a place like the University of South Florida, created following the Second World War to serve this expanding urban area, to, to, to serve um, non-traditional students, and in, that intentionally, the, the, the administrators there intentionally built no dormitories at, at the University of South Florida because they wanted the education to be inexpensive. And if you build dorms, then you have to charge students more, um, and it's cheaper for them to live at home and to commute. So you have, you have an, an institution in the form of USF that does not basically participate in the residential mission of the College of, of American Higher Education whatsoever. And yet we still call it a part of American higher education, right? So you're absolutely right that, the, that you have these sort of parallel, excuse me, these parallel tracks or these conflicting tracks. It's all part of one big package, but they have many, many different reasons for existing. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, you talk about following the, the Second World War. One of the big yeah. things that I always thought was just the GI Bill, yeah. which just drove untold millions of men and women to some yeah. extent yeah. into the colleges. And so I look today, and I've, we've got a president who's calling for free community college and mm -hmm. a presidential candidate who's suggesting free public education. I wonder what you think um, those trends mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, I'm all in favor of free education. I think it's terrific. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the more the better. How you pay for it, different question, right? Um, but I, I think that, um, I think that if, if you take a look at the enrollment trends from the mid 20th century, it's actually quite interesting. So you had growth throughout the 1920s, and then you have a decline in the 1930s, right? And that makes sense to us because of the Great Depression. Um, and uh, you then see uh, recovery prior to the Second World War and then another decline. And of course, that decline is, is a result of the draft, right? But immediately following World War II, in fact, even prior to the end of World War II, you see a sharp increase. And you see it for men and women. And the, the, the women's proportional representation declines significantly. But that's only because there are so many more men showing up. In fact, the, 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 in terms of absolute numbers, women continue to increase their, their college going rate all the, throughout the 1950s and the 1960s. The idea that there was somehow for, for women a, a sort of movement back into the home or something like this during the 1950s and, and, and a lack of participation in higher education simply is not borne out by the, by the data. Um, and so you see this increase. And so it's a general trend upward. But once you get into the 1950s and 60s, you just see this explosion uh, in American society and the number of people participating in higher education. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the growth of public institutions, particularly the junior and community colleges. Um, between 19, I'm gonna try to get this right, between 1964 and 67, uh, a community college opens every day in the United States. I mean, it is phenomenal growth. Um, and the idea here is, of course, that the more educated Americans are, the more productive citizens they're going to be, and, um, and the more they'll contribute, of course, to American growth economically. And that was true all the way through the 1970s. We now have this very interesting phenomenon 
um, in the United States in which we have stagnated in terms of college and university enrollment. And in fact, um, there are many other industrialized countries now that have higher rates of higher education participation than, than the United States does. Um, and I don't have the data with me um, to share with you, but, but one of the most interesting parts of what has happened over the past 10 to 20 years is that um, the group that has stagnated the most in terms of higher education participation is white men. Um, that most of the growth that we're seeing in higher education over the past 20 years is, is women and students of color, students who, the non-traditional students, students who have not um, had access to higher education. Um, but there's something you know, going on today in terms of the white male population, in terms of that stagnation that I think we really need to figure out. Whether or not offering a you know, free education would help to solve that problem, I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, I am just curious about which ethos you think things like competency-based education and MOOCs, the massive open online courses, where does that fit in terms of the idea of the ethos? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. So the um, question is about sort of competency-based education and MOOCs and some of the more recent developments, right, in higher education. So as I was suggesting, I think, you know, I, I do think we're in a moment of change and transition, uh, similar to other periods in, in, in the past. And um, if you accept my sort of you know, historical claim here, we're going to see the, the rise of new, some new kind of institutional type that's going to address some of these issues. And it's possible that it has something to do with virtual or online education. Um, now, what that looks like exactly, I'm not sure. Um, it, I, I have a pretty good sense of what it's going to look like for the older institutions, the places like, like Bowdoin and, and perhaps UNE. UNE is already well down this road. Um, but I think what that looks like is incorporating uh, newer technologies and ways of engaging students over distance and time into a previously existing program and creating what we might think of as sort of a hybrid form of, of higher education, which I think, by the way, is remarkably democratizing. Uh, I think it's a, a terrific, you know, when done well, uh, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a really great thing. The stodgy folks at Bowdoin don't want to go down this road, right? Uh, and they're sort of, you know, and again, because it's a residential college, there is a sort of resistance, you know, to that, and I, I, I totally get it. Um, but I, I think probably uh, what we're seeing is uh, newer developments in higher education trying to sort of shake themselves out, trying to sort of figure out how they will fit into this new form of education, higher education, that's going to that's going to develop over the next probably ten to twenty years. This isn't going to happen next week, right? It takes it takes periods of time for these things to change, and I and I think it'll be another ten or twenty years before American higher education sorts out exactly what it's going to be looking like um, in the future. But I think the competency based is a part of that. I certainly think the the virtual and the online stuff is a part of that. Yeah. We have another question right here. Sure. Yeah. You spoke of of. Uh, you spoke of affordability or one of the things. I'm going to give you some anecdotal information. In 1970, I graduated from Dartmouth. The room board and tuition was 2700 Dartmouth education today costs somewhere between sixty and 65000 That's an increase of about 13, 22 times. I went to medical school thereafter, and my cost was around 6200 my daughter is going to medical school now, and her cost is 80000 It's about 13 times. When I look at the education that's being provided, and I look at what my daughter's getting in medical school, it's impressive. It has changed. The stuff that is available to her during the educational process is nothing, is, is much more than I ever experienced in 1974. Yet when I talk to the graduates of Dartmouth, and what did they learn in 2015 versus what I was learning in 1970? There's really no material difference in the education. In 1991, when our first daughter was born, we estimated that the cost of uh, undergraduate education was going to go up 8% per year. In 1991, we calculated that when she went to school in 2010, 2008, it would cost about 220000 
we missed by about 10,000 what it was. So we could see it happening. It's, to me, a concern that it is a challenge now, one of the challenges for uh, undergraduate education now in the United States. What were the forces from your perspective that caused this to happen, and what do you think are the ways to meet that challenge? Great. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question. Make sure I get your email address, because when the book comes out, um, uh, the chapter on USF traces just what, you're, just what you're talking about there in terms of the rise in costs and affordability and, and the challenges around that. Um, so look, you used to be able to work your way through college, right? I mean, that's sort of, that was the way it worked. Um, it was, if it was a public institution, right, you could choose not to. You could, you could go someplace where it costs more. Um, but you had a choice of going to lots of places that provided a high quality education um, and you could work your way through college. Um, the, the housing sort of, you know, was awful, uh, cinder block dorm rooms, and the food was usually terrible. Um, uh, but you could do it. And, and that was part of we, what we had a sense at the time as an element of the American dream, right? Um, that is awfully hard to do now for students, right? It is really, really hard for students in America today, almost regardless of the institution, to, to, work, to work their way through college. And that, I think, is a real failure on our part to figure out uh, to, to keep in mind that, this, that, uh, that higher education in America is designed to sort of serve students and not the other way around, right? Um, so I, th I think for sure we've got, some, we've got our priorities backwards when it, when it comes to cost. I think for sure um, many of the recent developments around things like online education uh, are an a response in part to cost factors. Now, I, I know there are lots of for-profit online places that cost far more than they should, and in fact, the completion rates are really low, and it's terrible. I'm not supporting that at all. Um, but uh, when it comes right down to it, oftentimes online education doesn't have to do with providing a higher quality of education. Um, whether the quality is any different from what you would get from sitting in a classroom, you know, right? Um, but in terms of cost, right, you can have more students involved in the process and you should be able to, to, to manage or regulate the cost in some way. Um, that, at least, is the effort. Um, the quick answer to your question is sort of, you know, how did the, you know, how did the thing go spiraling off into orbit? Um, and the answer comes down to a couple of things. First of all, colleges and universities got into an arms race. Right? Um, if that institution has a nicer dorm than we do, then students might be more likely to go there. We better build a nicer dorm. If that place has a nicer fitness center than we do, we better build the climbing wall. If that, right, and then you go back and forth and back and forth. And the next thing you know, you're spending lots and lots of money on facilities, on dorms, on things like that, not necessarily a whole lot on the core educational project of the institution. Um, and then, of course, the other part had to do with the rankings, right? As soon as the rankings became sort of the coin of the realm, then you had places really needing to compete with each other um, in ways, this is this higher education marketplace piece, to compete, these institutions were competing in a way that they never had previously. And, um, and then suddenly everything mattered, right? Everything relating to the rankings mattered, and so you had to make investments that would make sure that you would sort of sustain your place in the rankings or, or go up in the rankings. Um, and then the final piece just really has to do with, um, it has to do with the rise of the research university in the United States. Uh, the more that institutions had access to sources outside of, outside of the state appropriation, the more likely the state appropriation was going to decline. And so post-1970, and it actually, that's exactly when it begins. In 1970, state appropriations begin declining. Public institutions need to find their money elsewhere. They start looking for external grants, uh, re lucrative research contracts, and suddenly the entire mission of the public institution, the public university, reorients in another direction. It's a, I mean, it's a remarkable development. By the way, the, the institutions were rational actors completely rational actors in, in, a, in, a, in a dramatically changing context economically, socially, politically. So, yeah. Question right here. So to follow up on that question, sure. I wonder to what extent you think another precipitating factor that's affected this is in higher education, the degree of requirements and things we're required to do, all the legislation, all the requirements for, so we have to have offices for integrity, offices, all yeah. these things to make yeah. sure that we're fulfilling the need so that students can get their student loans. To what extent do you think that 
I mean, if you look at one of the largest growing areas in universities, that tends to be the support services for yeah. students, uh, yeah. making sure that we're fulfilling all the requirements at the federal government, at the state government level. Yeah. And I didn't know if you think that also has impacted upon the cost. Oh, I think for sure. I think for sure. Um, we know that, you know, one of the greatest costs uh, in any major operation, whether it be a business or, a, or an educational institution or personnel costs, right? Um, and education tends to be a sector in which it's really, really hard to replace people with robots or less expensive, right, capital pieces of technology that, that you get a return on investment on more quickly over time. The education sector is just one of those places where you need a lot of people to get the job done well. And that keeps the cost relatively high in relation to, you know, to other sectors. So for sure, this is going to be part of it. As you lay on uh, greater requirements, whether it be bureaucratic or legislative requirements, then um, you see the institutions responding by having by having to hire more people and increase costs. And it's not just in that case, not just the public institutions, but the private institutions, you know, as well. Yeah. yeah. Question right in front. Uh, thanks. I just uh, in answer to the question from the the man from Dartmouth. The yeah. other reasons that university costs increase so much is because they could. Yeah. Uh, for right. decades, uh, schools right. could raise their tuition six, seven, eight percent a year with uh, impunity, right. um, largely because it's still paid off. Yeah. Getting that education and, and, and getting the debt um, still was better than not having that education. That's right. And yeah. now we're finally seeing that that calculus isn't working yeah. as well anymore. And schools, uh, UNE's tuition increase has been 2% in the last couple of years and mm. will continue to be that. Yeah. Uh, so those days are over. Right. Um, yeah. I wanted to, to just quickly say I completely or almost completely disagree mm. with the premise of what this fine gentleman articulated so well. And you said you're absolutely right. So mm. let me just give it a try and you tell me what you think. Sure. Um, the idea that there's this two tracks or maybe even more of the university dedicated to knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and you know the pursuit of truth and the betterment of human beings and, and the one that's that's about uh, getting a job. Mm. I, I just don't buy that. I think um, I think uh, with perhaps the exception of the beginning and the whole Greek and Latin and a very elite kind of uh, group of people, uh, going to college has always been about getting a job, even though the lucky ones among us, as you described, experience it very differently. That's one of the joys of going to college is so much more than that. But even for those of, who, of us who say we're in the education business or I'm a student because I love the liberal arts, if you said, would you still be here if it weren't going to help you get a better job when you're done? They wouldn't be, and their parents certainly wouldn't yeah, be yeah. be sending them. Yeah. So it just seems to me this false distinction that's really kind of elitist. That that is about um, you know whether it's the Bowdens or the Swarthmores or you know uh, the Yales or whatever, saying we're about the pursuit of knowledge, and you you know University of Maine over there is about getting people jobs. Everybody at Bowdoin and Swarthmore gets a job too, and I don't think they'd be in it otherwise. Sure. sure. So, um, so that just feels like, like I said, kind of artificial, but also kind of elitist. So yeah. I just wonder what your thoughts are about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say a, a couple of things in response. I would say a, a lot of this has to do with whose perspective we're looking at things from, right? So if we are the students. Uh, for sure, students across the country today are going to colleges and universities in part because it's going to position them for employment, right? May not prepare them in some practical way for employment, right? You can't take an accounting course at Bowdoin College. There's no accounting course, right? Um, you can study economics, but you can't take accounting. And that actually matters in terms of the actual institutional identity of the place. That matters a lot. Now, the students will still come to Bowdoin because they believe it will position them well to get a job after, after they graduate. But the institution itself is making a claim that is, it is explicitly not occupational. Now, that may be an elitist claim, or it may be an elitist goal. But for sure, that is, that's the claim that the institution's making. And it's the claim that, that Bowdoin made 200 years ago, 
Um, even students 200 years ago went to Bowdoin in part because it was going to position them to, to succeed in a way that they might not have succeeded in society more broadly. That may not have been, success may not have been more as clearly defined as material success. It might have had more to do with other things. Um, but for sure, students are going to be there in part you know, to get a job. Um, the flip side of this institutionally, of course, would be you know, some, of, some colleges and, and universities which are explicitly designed for vocational preparation, right? I mean, if your slogan is learn to earn, um, then you are in business for the reason of preparing students to get a job that pays well. And you're explicit about it. Uh, it's, in your, it's in your mission statement. And it's, it's in the course curricula when you take a look at the courses that are being offered. That's what it's there to do. So institutionally, I think it's, there, there is a big difference. Although I certainly would agree with you that students who are going to college and university expect at least some return on their investment. And that is not a new idea, by the way. I mean, it, one of the things that I look at at the, at the book is a, in the book is a really, in the Stanford chapter, is a really interesting um, series of articles that, were, that was published in the Saturday Evening Post in the year 1900. The cover story, this is the year 1900, the cover story for the Saturday Evening Evening Post is, is college worth it? And they meant that financially. It wasn't like, is it worth it because you'll be a good citizen? It is, is it worth it because will it pay off when I'm done? So this idea of like, you know, college should pay off as an investment or something is, you know, is not new at all. This has been around for a really long time. A question right here. This is something of a continuation of that, yeah. but takes it in a different direction. I'd like to hear your opinion of the four profit, the University of Phoenix, Kaplan, DeVry, et cetera, et cetera. What's your um, estimation of the education that's received? And is it simply a for-profit endeavor? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a great question, right? So it is absolutely a for-profit endeavor. Um, and most of those places are very explicit about that. I mean, they're for, right? They're for-profit companies. Some of them are public tra uh, traded publicly. Um, that is very much what they're designed to be and do. And they're selling a product or a service. Right? It's a it's a for-profit model. It's not a non not for profit. Model. It's a for-profit model. They're selling a product or a service, and there should be some sort of return on the on the on the investment uh, associated with that. What we know from the sort of studies that have come out in just the past few years is that a lot of these places um, are abysmal in terms of the quality of the education that they're providing, and it's certainly in terms of the completion rates. I mean, it, you know, some of these institutions have you know 17 percent completion rates, and yet, and this is the shocking part, 80 percent of the income to some of these for-profit institutions is coming from government subsidized loans, right? It's public money, and it's being literally funneled into these places. And these places, there's almost no accountability in terms of the quality of the education being provided uh, and, the, and the graduation and completion rates. So that's not to say all of them are like that. I mean, there, there are some that are actually quite good and meet a definite need. Um, but certainly in terms of what was going, what, what happened with Corinthian not long ago with the U.S. Department of Education essentially stepping in and basically, you know, saying we're going we're gonna to have to shut this down. This is, this is you know, ludicrous. Um, that is a sign, I think, of the times. But in that, it's a, it's a part of the transformation, I think, that colleges and universities are going through today. Yeah. Got a question right here? Yeah, the question is about uh, student debt. So from the 1970s, when things started to go up, and right now, you know, what, 55, 65,000 for a private school, how much was it affected by the fact that loans were available to all these students? Yeah, yeah, it's a, gr it's a great question. Um, it's, it's generally accepted in terms of the folks who study these things um, um, that making so many public dollars available for the expansion of enrollments permitted the institutions to increase their tuition rates more quickly than they otherwise would have. Um, 
I don't know how much more you know to say how how much more I can say about it other than that. Obviously, it was a good thing to make you know public dollars available to students who didn't have access to college or university because of the cost. On the other hand, you know these these double digit tuition increases that we saw in the 1980s were in part driven because of greater access to you know to that. Um, and for sure, now you have presidential candidates saying that you know public uh, university, public higher education could be free. W right? What what would that mean? Do those institutions then sort of get to charge whatever they want, and then they're right at the edge of the federal government has to step in and pay the bill, or are there caps on the increases, or sort of how does that work uh, in practice? We don't know, but generally speaking, yes, I think that you know the sense is that that was part of what was going on there. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, I guess my question goes back to your title and the, the common good. And I'm thinking about um, the crisis in ed higher education in terms of the culture wars. And I'm not sure that the book really is taking that up, but I'm interested because of also the comment you made about the decline of white males yeah. in universities. Yeah. So you have on the one hand the sense that the common good that higher education is promoting is that of democracy and that requires civic discourse, critical discourse, and the development of that capacity to engage other people in that kind of um, conversation. But outside of the university, you hear it, it described as political correctness or these various things that we can debate what, what's actually happening. But I'm wondering if you could just comment on that side of higher education in terms of, of contributing to democratic culture and um, critique and those sort of things and how, the, how that's part of what's changing yeah. um, or not. Sure, sure. So it's a great question. It's a, you know the content of the curriculum is is in in, in part what the question is about. Um, how that has changed over time. What I try to do in the book is track the change. Um, I don't say a whole lot about um, how the change influenced how we conceive of the education necessary for civic competence and 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 good citizenship, because it's not clear to me that we really know. Um, we all have our own sort of sense of, of what would be best. Um, but what is actually best? So, um, for instance, is the classical education that students uh, was received, that, the, that students received during the early national period, was that a better form of education to prepare students to engage in a democratic society than the education maybe that's offered on many colleges and university campuses today? I actually have no idea, right? Uh, it's really, really hard to know. We know that so many of them studied so many of the same things that college graduates had a shared body of knowledge and culture that they could reference in terms of um, their commitment to or uh, engagement in democratic society. We know that because it was so shared it was so common. This is sort of the great, one of the elements of the great books theory, is that if we all read the same set of books, um, whether they're a classical, classical literature or not, then we have this shared culture from which we can derive some shared sentiments around, and, and our decision making operates in some more comprehensive or functional way. But whether or not that's actually true or whether or not someone who has experienced a great books program of study um, is going to be a better citizen someday than someone who hasn't, you know, I just don't know, just don't know. Question down front. Thank you. <clears throat> so you are in such a pivotal position, given that we're in a paradigm shift. We're not just shifting into a new chapter. This is a paradigm shift. Mm. And to me, the hard facts of we have more women going to universities now. Mm. I mean, that's a hard fact. Yeah. Yeah. That's reality. Mm -hmm. We have the hard facts of looking at the 70s, and, and I think we have to ask concretely, what is that funding that's coming in, and how did it grow exponentially? Mm. Where we have government supporting, we know how much funding is going in for what projects. How did higher education change in that era? And also, can we afford to not include 
other, cult other cultures, other countries. We're in such a pivotal place. Yeah. So you're in a very huge position to be able to ground mm. those questions mm. that need to be asked mm. so that we can grow and lead once again. Yeah. You know, we have other cultures where the word is out. You can go to school in Holland and Sweden and Norway and Denmark for free yeah. for your MA and your PhD. Right. You right. know, so the, yeah. this is pivotal. So yeah. I really honor the position that you're in. Are, and do you, are, do you feel like you're addressing that? Mm, thanks, thanks. Um, uh, my hope is that the, the book, which, you know, which should be out this year, will contribute to the conversation in a responsible way and in a way that helps to inform our understanding of the dynamics versus um, simply taking a sort of um, more radical claim, which I think is what Kevin Carey is doing in, in the end of college. If, if you read the book, if you read the book, it's wonderfully written books. It's very enjoyable to read. But I, th I think this idea that um, the college is over and now we need to be thinking differently, I, I just don't think this is historically accurate at all. And I think we need a much, much more nuanced understanding of the complexity of American higher education if we're going to actually sort of make sense of what needs to come next so that the focus is on the quality of the education that students are receiving and not all of the other stuff that, as some of you have, have mentioned, has sort of you know, creeped into how we're defining education over time. Um, but thank you. I mean, it, it makes me think twice about sort of the, the role of my, my work here. So, yeah. And thank you, Chuck. Thanks, Anwar. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Thank you.